Hello everyone, welcome or welcome back again to another video tutorial from the AP3X Institute of Mathematics Education. My name is Akin, your math instructor. In today's video, I'm going to be walking you through the May-June 2023 Caribbean Secondary Education Certificate Examination for Mathematics. Now, of course, uh, on my channel, I primarily provide mathematical contents that aids students that participates in the year-to-year -year exam that is held right across the Caribbean that is in fact held in January and in May, June of each year. So of course, if this is the first time here on the channel, of course, consider subscribing to the channel where you can find weekly and daily tutorials um, that aids you in preparation for exams or just math in general. Of course, I do provide content for college students as well. So definitely also you can check the playlist that is pinned in the description of the video or just on my community playlist then. Uh, do not forget to leave a like before you go if you find any value in the content provided here. Leave your thoughts, opinions, suggestions, comments down below. And do not forget to share this out to your math communities. Alright, so we're going to be diving on right in to the solutions for today's exam. I am going to try to break this video up into three parts. That is working questions 1 through to 4, then questions 5 through to 8, and then of course in part 3 I'm going to be working questions um, 9 and 10. Alright, so I want you guys to get involved with me. Uh, what would be best for you here is if you can have your pens and papers out and as you see the questions you can actually try to participate in answering the questions by pausing the video and then of course when you're done you can unpause the video so you can match your solutions with mine all right so we're going to be diving on right in all right guys have your calculators out pens papers geometry sets and let's just have some fun while we are learning and preparing for our year to year exam so let's get it let's go all right, guys, so uh, the usual, of course, nothing is different. If you've ever participated in a CSEC examination, the screen that you're seeing here is a very familiar screen where basically um, you're told that the exam then is two hours and 40 minutes long. Of course, we have a series of instructions here, which the examiner, the invigilator, will then provide you with so we're not going to be going through all of that the usual this paper consists of two sections section one and section two and uh section one has seven questions section two has three questions which are all compulsory and you know the whole list of course you are in fact provided with a formula sheet that can be sometimes quite useful in remembering certain formulas such as the volume uh the trig ratios the Couple, couple of years of triangles and circles and sectors. So hopefully we might see, say here, um, an opportunity to use this formula sheet. All right, so we're gonna be diving on right in. I'm gonna be, um, this is going to be the assumption that you guys are in fact very much familiar with, say here, uh, the contents that are on this exam. Of course, I'll try to provide you with alternative methods in how to approach each question when I am given the opportunity to do so. All right, so let's dive right on in say here. All right, so the first question here says that we should find the exact value of five over six plus two over three minus 12 over 35 multiplied by seven over nine. Now, what I find is that when it comes to examination, many students tend to um, have a little bit of phobia for exams and they tend to forget the basic principle. Once you approach a math paper in general, especially for CSEC, you want to ensure that everything remains fundamental. So 
the very first thing that I see here is the fact that a student may just in fact meet the error here by going ahead to add or subtract the fractions. You must in fact remember the arithmetic, the order of arithmetic here. You must multiply then before you add or subtract in this particular example. So here we're going to just go ahead and write our 5 over 6 plus our 2 over 3. And then, of course, we're going to subtract the result of this fraction here. So, of course, when it comes to uh, multiplying fractions, what we're looking at then is, in fact, cancelling the numerators with the denominators. So, if you look carefully here, you'll realize that, see here, 3 goes into 9 3 times, and 3 goes into 12 4 times, and 7 into itself 1 time, and 7 into 35 5 times. So then we end up with a result here of 4 times 1 is in fact 4 and 5 times 3 is in fact 15. Right? So if you have made an error, that is where the error would have most likely occurred where you tend to forget the order of arithmetic. Now, here is a nice example here where we have the same rule being applied for the particular operation. Here you are asked to add the two, add these two fractions and subtract the result. If you wish to work it out in parts, that's entirely up to you. But you can just go right ahead and just find the LCM immediately here. All right, so it looks as if, say here, the LCM potentially would have obviously been, say, about 30 here. Okay, 15 goes into 30, 3 goes into 30, 6 goes into 30. So then 6 into 30 goes, say here, 5 times, going to multiply the top by 5. 3 into 30 goes 10 times, going to multiply the top here by 10. And 15 into 30 goes 2 times, multiply the top here by 2. All right, 5 times 5 is in fact 25. And 2 times 10 is going to be, say here, 20. And 4 times 2 here is going to be, say here, 8. So when we go ahead then and we add these two numbers here then we subtract the result it so happens that the result here works out to be say here 37 over 30 all right and if you wish to leave your answer as a mixed fraction then it would be 1 and 7 over 30 all right remember that you can only use this rule whenever the rules um, for both operations are the same Right, so we could not have found the LCM just um, as we started the question because the rules for multiplication differs from that of the rules of addition and subtraction then. All right, so we've just gained two marks then. Now, of course, it's nice to get your calculators out already. It says here that we're to calculate the values of the square root of one take away the cost of 37 degrees squared. Uh, correct to three decimal places all right so i'm just gonna go ahead then and just kind of rewrite my question here so it's the square root of one take away say here i'm just gonna go on my calculator then and i'm going to say here uh find the cost of 37 degrees so cost 37 ensure that your calculator is in degree mode so that's going to be zero point uh, that's going to be zero point seven nine eight six so zero point seven nine eight six of course i'm going to square that result then all right so be careful not to square the 37 and then find the cost that's a brutal error on your part there so we're going to move on then to say here the square root of one take away and we're going to square that number okay so we're going to square that number we're going to get 0 0.6378 so 0. 6378 and so 1 take away 0 0.6378 uh, that's going to give us say here the square root of 0 0.3622 and then finally then we find the square root of that number 0 0.3622 we end up with 0 0.6 zero one they did say to three decimal places so if you're working with me here you'll see that this is zero point six zero two so zero point six zero two correct to three decimal places then 
all right so nice question there that gave us a value of see here two marks so we are off to a pretty good start as well let's scroll on down here to part two then uh write 0 0.00527 in standard form and of course in standard form the objective is to write the particular number given in the form a multiplied by uh 10 raised to the power of n that's the objective so remember that when it comes to standard form your value of a must be greater than or equal to one but at the same time then a must be less than 10 all right so at the moment right now the number that we have is way 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 less than one we need to be at least one or greater so the objective here then is to try to move our point in the direction that's going to give us that particular value so if i kind of zoom up here for you then you will realize just a second here guys gotcha so here if we zoom up right here you'll see i'm going to be moving my point in between here and here and here so i've placed my point in between five and two so now my actual new number now is 5.27 that number is greater than one and at the same time it is less than 10 i'm then going to multiply this then by the base 10 but i need to determine what is my n value and my n value is based on the amount of places that i jumped the point and in what direction i jumped the point so here zero point uh i jumped one two three and i jumped to my right so it works the opposite of the number line so in fact i jumped three places to my right which makes my n value here negative remember on the number line then going to the right is positive and going to the left is negative standard form works in the opposite if you go to the right then the power is negative and if you go to the left the power is positive all right so that is then my result that I'm actually looking for. So it's 5.27 times 10 to the power of negative 3. All right, let's move on then. So that was a fairly easy mark there for one, nothing too solid, nothing too difficult there for you. Let's move on to the worded section of question, the worded section of question one. Now it's talking here about a particular person by the name of Harish. Harish works at a call center for 35 hours each week. Now he's paid an hourly rate of 11.20. Our first task is to calculate the amount of money Harish earns in a four week month, in a four week month. All right, because of course you know that sometimes you have certain months that will end up with a five week right months days rolling over so therefore then i know that he works 35 hours each week so already i know that that's 35 hours each week right and then of course for each of those hours he's paid a total of 11 dollars and 20 cents that's going to be multiplied by 11.2 two zero and then of course because it's every week that he works this particular money here i want to calculate for a four week month so that's multiplied by four so you just go on your calculator then and you write 35 you type pardon me 35 times 11.20 multiplied by four and that produces the answer here of one thousand five hundred and sixty eight dollars all right and that is the basic interpretation behind that particular question then so let's move on then to the next part it says that in a certain week harish worked eight hours overtime however overtime hours are paid at one and a half times the usual rate of eleven dollars and twenty cents per hour our task is to find the total amount of money Harish is paid for that week. Now, note here that each week Harish would have worked 35 hours. And for that particular week, of course, he's paid the usual rate of $11.20. So therefore, on a normal basis, Harish would have received, say here, 35 uh, multiplied by eleven dollars and twenty cents. So this is Harish's usual pay of three hundred and twenty dollars. Now, in addition to this three twenty, then Harish would have actually worked, say here, some 
OT hours, some overtime hours. All right. And so Harish basically works eight hours overtime and he's paid the usual rate of $11.20, which is then not the usual for overtime. Overtime is paid at one and a half. So that's 1.5. So therefore then uh, we can go on our calculator to check his extra pay that he got. That is eight multiplied by 11.20. And of course we have to hike that up a little bit by times in it by 1.5. So he would have gotten an extra $134 and say here, uh, 40 cents so therefore the total that he would have gone home for that particular week then would have been his usual pay plus say here the overtime extra of 134 dollars and 40 cents so therefore then this looks to be 454 dollars and 40 cents for that week all right, pretty good. We could have gotten this value by simply dividing what we have up here by four. That would have actually given back us the weekly because this calculation up here was for a four week month. So if we divide the value that we just got by four, would have gotten, say here again, the 320. All right, wonderful. So I hope that you guys were able to maximize on a minimum say here of about seven out of the nine give or take let me know in the comments if you got all nine marks and let us continue then all right so moving on to question two which usually you're going to find most of the algebraic uh questions in this particular question number so what we're looking at here is in fact to simplify four divided by 5x multiplied by 15x divided by 16 and so what we're looking at here is in fact a algebraic fraction involving multiplication so the same rules that apply for numeric uh, multiplication of fractions is applied for algebraic multiplication of fractions we're looking for something to cancel so here we're looking at the fact that 4 into itself goes one time and 4 into 16 goes 4 and of course, 5 into itself one time and 5 into 15, 3. And so, of course, x will cancel x down here. So we end up then with 1 times 3 is in fact 3. And 1 times 4 is in fact 4. All right. And that is your answer. Very simple. All right. Nothing much there. It is just one mark. So not much calculation is really needed for this question. I want to also remind you guys that if you go into your exam, you have to be very mindful of over preparing yourself, expecting that an exam may be challenging. Sometimes it, it is expected to be challenging. And then, of course, you find yourself overlooking a very simple question like that. Let me know if you actually got this question right, because maybe you're overthinking. All right. All right, remember that when I'm working these questions, it's not particular to work the questions in a time frame. I want to provide you with a lot of different tips, examination tips, um, alternative approaches to the question. I want to spend time in giving you the ultimate preparation. Giving you the answers is one. Having you well prepared for the exam is another thing. So I want to provide you with multiple options and alternatives to getting to your solution. Part B then asks us to solve the inequality 12 minus 4m less than or equal to 5 take away 8m. Now, of course, with an inequality, you will find here that our objective is to isolate the unknown variable. So we can choose to carry the, say here, negative 8m to the left, or we can choose to carry the negative 4m to the right. I particularly encourage my students that when you're transposing, always transpose to the side of the larger coefficient. So when you look at minus 4 and minus 8, you'll know right away that minus 4 is in fact larger than minus 8. So I'm I particularly will be tempted to transpose the negative 8 to this side, see here. And once I get my m's on one side, I can therefore carry my number on the other side. So now I'll end up having negative, pardon me, not negative, because of course I transpose the negative 8m, it becomes positive 8m. 
and down i'm gonna have negative 4m already on the left and so that's going to be less than or equal to say here 5 uh take away say here 12 all right and so 8m minus 4m is in fact say here 4m and that's going to be less than or equal to 5 take away 12 that's going to be equal to negative 7 and so if i split the product between the 4 and the m then m is going to be less than or equal to negative 7 divided by 4 and that's my result right so that's kind of like what you want to do of course i want to provide my students with alternative approaches to the question so then what happens to the student who did not carry the negative eight to the left what if you guys had decided to carry the negative four m to the right and carry the five over here now i particularly as i said prefer when my subject is positive but if it's unavoidable then of course no problem say you have 12 over here and you brought over the five to the left you're going to end up with negative 5 and that's going to still be less than or equal to negative 8m of course when you bring the negative 4m is going to become positive 4m all right and so 12 takeaways 5 is in fact 7 and that's going to be less than or equal to uh, negative 8m plus 4m is in fact negative 4m now Here's where you guys might get caught and why you perhaps might not be seeing the same answer on screen as you have on your page that you're currently working is whenever you divide an inequality or whenever you split the product of an inequality um, by a negative coefficient, then you must reverse the sign. So this is going to become 7 divided by negative 4. I'm going to reverse the sign here and say greater than or equal to, say here, m. Remember, once you divide both sides by negative 4, it's going to cancel. So therefore, then, we end up with negative 7 over 4 is in fact greater than or equal to m. And they are the same answer. If you notice that the mouth of the sign right here is closed towards the m and also here it's closed towards the m as well so it's just written in a different direction but it is the same answer all right all right so hopefully you guys got that you can definitely check out a full playlist on solving linear equations and inequality that is on my channel so check in the description of the video you'll find a link pinned that will take you over to that platform then all right so now we're going to go on then to some more application questions involving algebra and so what we're looking at then is the diagram below shows a compound shape l m n p q r and the word compound meaning that we have more than one shapes attaching itself to form some sort of diagram so to speak so here this particular shape doesn't really have a name but it's obvious that it's a compound shape let us see if they told us what compound shape it was it says that it was made from two rectangles the length of the diagrams which are written in terms of x are on say here in centimeters so already when i look at this my first observation is that it seems as if then that this here if i just take here and extend this auxiliary line here you'll then see the two rectangles that are actually making up this diagram that's the first thing that i observe now students whenever you approach this type of question that you're not seeing say here numerical values for right where you can just simply add and go through and get to your answer it is the same procedure as if it was numerical it's going to be the same procedure when it's algebraically written it's just that of course with algebra you can only add like terms all right let's see what they have asked us to do here okay so we have a bunch of measurements here we have 4x minus 5 we have x plus 3 we have x plus 1 we have 3x here so let's have a look let's do some interpretation here it says find an expression in terms of x for the length of pq so for the length of pq we're looking for the length of pq that is right here all right now PQ then is in fact, say here, uh, PQ then is in fact uh, part of the complete side MN. So if you notice here, let me just grab a different color ink then. Okay, so if you notice here that MN 
is the full line and PQ is a part of it. We can't say it's a halfway. We're not sure. We just know that it's a part of MN. So since MN is the full line, all I have to do is just subtract the side that I know over here. Okay. Because MN is made up of PQ and it's also made up of LR. So LR plus PQ give us MN. So if I can subtract the length of LR from MN, then I'll get my expression. So I can therefore write an equation for this, that PQ, okay? So PQ is equal to, PQ is equal to um, MN take away LR, right? And we know that based on the diagram here, MN is in fact 3X whatever units and we're going to therefore then go ahead and subtract LR here LR is X plus 3 here's the trick when you're subtracting a binomial expression you have to put it in a bracket so some of you guys may have written down here 3X take away X plus 3 that is going to be very very much incorrect you have to subtract the binomial expression but it has to go into a bracket so you're going to end up with say here 3x minus x minus 3 as opposed to 3x minus x plus 3 all right tricky little question there by csec all right so then we end up with say here 2x take away 3 that there represents the result to uh for the expression for uh, PQ. So let's go ahead then and write that on our diagram then. We know that that's going to be, this side here is going to be 2x minus 3. Alright, that can significantly affect where we go to next. Alright. What I like about CSEC questions is that they are set up in such a domino effect form. It almost feels like if I get one question incorrect, then I'm automatically going to get the remaining questions incorrect as well because they are tied together. So it's, it's imperative, students, that you check and check and check to make sure that you've written down the correct thing. All right. So with this question, then just that fact that you left that bracket out will particularly cause a domino effect in wrong answers then all right so beautiful here now we're looking for rq so let's go on our diagram then rq let's try to find that rq so we're looking for this side here this side right here rq and so if you notice that rq then is kind of very similar to how we found pq rq is in fact say here let me just grab here so rq here you'll realize that it is all of this side up here minus this side down here so rq is in fact lm minus pn so rq is ln lm minus pn all right so it's lm LM, that is L here and M, so it's all of that side up there, take away this bottom side down here that I have, that is PN, all right? And so therefore then, we're looking at, say here, LM is uh, 4X, is it minus? Yes, it is 4X minus 5, so it's 4X minus 5. And remember that if you're subtracting a binomial expression from another binomial expression, the second one must be in bracket. So PN is X plus 1. So that's going to be negative X plus 1. All right. So now we can go ahead and distribute that negative sign here. This, so 4X take away 5. And negative times X or negative 1 times X is negative X. And of course, negative by positive is negative 1. So this simplifies then to 4x take away x. That's going to be 3x. All right, let's just group it like terms for everyone to understand. Okay, so that's going to be 4x take away x. And that's going to be minus 5 take away 1. So that's going to be 3x take away 6. And that is going to be our solution that is going to be the expression we're looking for for rq let's put that on our diagram 3x minus 6. 
Right, so now that we have that written down there, this is such a nice question in terms of getting the students to add and subtract algebraic terms. This is something that I would not, not naturally teach when I'm in my live classes. I would teach my students how to add and subtract algebraic terms, but I would not have given them the question in this applied form. So this is a really, 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 really nice question here by CXC to test the students' interpretation skills, all right? All right, guys, so we're going to be moving on then to this part where it says that we are given. All right, so it says here, given that the total area of the shape is 414 squared centimeters, we are to show that x squared plus x minus 72 equals zero. So in order for us to do this, guys, we need to go back to our main diagram that we have up here. And so in this main diagram here, we know that this particular diagram here was in fact made up of two rectangles. So we know that, say here, the rectangle that I have shaded here in blue here in this direction and the rectangle that I have shaded in blue in that direction here, we need the length and the width of both of these rectangles individually. Now, we know that the length of this rectangle here is in fact 3x minus 6 and the width is x plus 3. So the length is 3x minus 6 and the width is x plus 3. So we're going to go down here, 3x minus 6. So therefore then the area of rectangle 1 is in fact length times width. And that's going to be 3x minus 6 by, say here, x plus 3. All right, and then we're going to add, say, the area of rectangle 2 then, which is also length times width. And so if you go back up to our diagram then and look at the rectangle that is standing up, then the length is x plus 1 and the width is 3x. Well, in fact, the length is uh, 3x and the width is x plus 1. So that's 3x times x plus 1. So that's going to be that this is going to be added to the area of rectangle 2 is 3x bracket, uh, say here, x plus 1, all right? And now bear in mind that they had stated here that the it, the area, the total area of the shape here is in fact 414 squared centimeters, all right? So therefore, then let's go ahead and expand this bracket then. So we end up having, say here, uh, 3x open bracket say here x plus 3 all right so we're going to be using the first term to multiply the second bracket and the second term here to multiply the second bracket as well so that's x plus 3 all right and then of course we have say here uh this same 3x here times x plus 1 and that is of course equal to 414 all right now the next thing then is to go ahead and distribute so we're going to go ahead and say here 3x times x that is going to be 3x squared and 3x times 3 that's going to give us 9x minus 6 times x that is minus 6x and minus 6 times 3 that's minus 18. Same here, 3x times x, that's going to be 3x squared, and 3x times 1, that's going to give us 3x, and that's equal to, say here, 414, all right? And so now remember that we have to equate everything to 0, so we're going to group like terms and equate to 0, so that's 3x, there's another 3x out here, so that's going to be plus 3x, then we end up having 9x here, and then we have that minus 6x here, then we have this plus 3x here, so all the x's are together, then we have our minus 18, of course we need everything to be equal to 0, so we're going to transpose to 414, we're going to get minus uh, 414, so that's minus 414, that's just, that's, it's not written properly, so that's going to be minus 414, and that's now equal to zero. So our objective, guys, is to simplify that expression to get the form x squared plus x minus 72. So 3x squared plus, again, say here, 3x squared is equal to 6x squared. Then we have 9x minus 6x, that's 3x, 3x plus 3x, that is, of course, 6x again. 
and of course we have minus 18 minus 414 if you hop onto your calculator you should get 432 and that is therefore equal to zero so if you go ahead then and divide say here the whole entire expression by six then of course let's check it out here if we divide say here the this by six and divide this by six and divide this by six it should pretty much produce the result that we're looking for so this six cancels this six we end up with x squared this six cancels this six so we end up with x and uh, it so happens that 432 divided by six is in fact 72 and now everything is equal to zero and beautifully then we have achieved the objective of x squared plus x minus 72 there we go all right so this is a really really nice applied question here presented to us on this particular paper really really like this question on csec it does really put the students ability to not only simplify algebraic expressions but to apply the concept um to a different format all right so then four marks it was in fact worth it all right now let's wrap this video up here by completing all of question three and then of course in part two i'm going to be walking you through questions four five and six and then we're going to wrap up say here in part three with questions seven eight nine and ten all right now for this particular question then what we're looking at is this particular shape then and this particular shape here is a it says here that the diagram below shows a semicircle with diameter ac b is a point on the circumference and ab is equal to bc which is equal to 8.2 so let's make an observation here all right now the mere fact that these two sides are equal that is in fact ab and bc we know right away that this say here is 8.2 and so a triangle that has two equal sides is known as an isosceles triangle and so with an isosceles triangle right away then i know that the angles at the base are going to be exactly the same so i know that this angle here that faces that equal side is going to be equal to the angle here that faces this equal sides right here all right now another observation that we can make here is the fact that ac is a diameter and one of the theorems that governs shapes drawn with then a circle or semicircle in this case is that if the diameter subtends an angle or it bounds or creates an angle anywhere on the circumference then the point at which the diameter makes the angle is equal to 90 degrees so right away then not only is this an isosceles triangle but it is in fact a right isosceles triangle so it is called a right isosceles triangle okay all right so these are the observations that we've made so far let us see here uh we said that ac is the diameter so that might be handy a little bit later let's see what they say here they said state the geometric name for the line ab and so from here to here ab that is in fact called a chord that is c-h-o-r-d now an explanation for why it is called a chord was not required but just for the purpose of learning guys a chord is really a line that is drawn within the bounds of the circumference of a circle to touch any two parts of the circumference all right so the diameter is also called a chord as well it has to touch any two parts of the circumference for it to be categorized as being a chord all right next question then says that we should find the value of the radius of the circle so if you're looking for the radius then that means right away i can safely say that the radius of a circle is equal to the diameter divided by two so in this case then the diameter based on the diagram here is in fact ac so ac is our diameter so it's going to be the distance of ac divided by two all right so r is equal to diameter divided by two the diameter in this case is ac so it's going to be ac divided by two therefore the objective then for us is to therefore then find ac so therefore ac is equal to let's go on our diagram and see what we can do here 
AC from here to here. Now, it is a right angle triangle. So right away, the very first thing that pops up in my mind is in fact, potentially the trig ratio, or it could be the Pythagoras theorem. Now in this case, it kind of jumps out at me that Pythagoras theorem is more applicable and a lot easier to get to my solution. But of course, you know, I'm going to be providing you with alternative approaches to getting the question. So I'm going to be doing this two ways to get our answer. All right, so I'm going to start off with the most obvious, um, the most obvious, say here, approach, which is the Pythagoras theorem. And of course, we know that AC implies that C squared is going to be equal to A squared plus, say here, B squared. So C squared, of course, we know that C is assigned to a specific side on the diagram on the right angle triangle, which is in fact, C is usually labeled um by the hypotenuse, which is the side that faces the 90 degrees. So right away, then I know that C squared in this case is going to be AC squared. Now, A and B are going to obviously be the other two sides, which are 8.2 and 8.2 respectively. So that's going to be 8.2. Okay, pardon me, guys. So that's going to be 8.2 squared plus 8.2 squared. All right, so therefore then AC squared is then equal to, I think it was 67.24 that I had calculated earlier. So 8.2 squared, it is 67.24. So that's 67.24 plus 67.24. And when we add those two numbers together, then we're going to end up, see here, it's 134.48, so that's AC squared is equal to 134.48. Now, AC then is going to be equal to the root of 134.48. So if we hop onto our calculators and press 134 square root, sorry, square root of 134.48, we get an answer here of 11.6 rounded off to one decimal place. So that's 11.6. So that's 11.6 rounded off to one decimal place. Now bear in mind that that is AC, but remember we said that the radius is AC divided by two. So AC then is 11.6 divided by two, and that's equal to say here, uh, five point eight centimeters so that's going to be divided by two five point eight rounded off it's five point seven nine but rounded off is about five point eight centimeter here for the length of the radius all right so that's a nice little question there mixing a little bit of Pythagoras theorem with a little bit of measurement there so really really nice question here three marks it was in fact worth it really lovely question cxc Let's move on then to say here the, yeah, it says each interior angle of a reg regular polygon is 160 degrees. Calculate the number of sides that the polygon has. Now, of course, uh, some s teachers will tell you that the internal angle of a polygon, so the, let me just write this down here. The interior angle of a polygon is in fact equal to 180 uh, n minus 360 all divided by n that will tell you see here uh, well when i when i divide it by n it tells me the number of sides but when i don't divide it by n then it tells me the size of the angle that is in fact in the polygon some other instructors will see also that it is 180 open bracket n minus 2 all divided by n and that will give us the number of sides that is on the polygon now here we are told that the interior angle is 160 so we know right away that i'm going to be using my traditional form that i use all the time with my students that is 180 n minus 360 divided by n i know that the interior angle is already 160 so i'm going to equate the formula to 160. now if we go ahead then and we cross multiply or if we multiply both sides by n if i go ahead then and multiply the left side here by n here 
and I multiply over here by say here n, then this n cancels this n, so I'm easily left then with 180n minus uh, say here 360, and that's equal to 160n. Right now, if we group like terms here, we have 180n minus 160n because it was transposed over here and that's going to be equal to negative 360 goes over becomes positive 360 degrees so 180n minus 160n that is going to be 20n and that's going to be equal to 360 degrees so therefore then we end up then that the number of sides of this polygon is 360 divided then by say here 20 and it works so that the number of sides on this polygon is in fact 18 sides all right so that's 18 sides for us there all right pretty good pretty good question then all right so that's how you'd approach this particular question just make sure that you know your interior angle formula or the number of sides on a polygon formula which can either be one of the following that i've listed above here all right now let's move on then down to part c of this question all right so what we're looking at here is the diagram below shows a trapezium a all right so let's just zoom up here so the diagram below shows a trapezium a that is drawn on a square grid and here we can see our trapezium a there beautiful all right let's scroll on down here it says on the diagram above n draw the image of a after it undergoes number one a reflection in the line x equal negative one and then of course we're going to label that image a prime so a reflection in the line x equal negative one this is what i refer to as a non-standard reflection you can find a link that will be pinned in the description of this video to my reflection um explanation video all right you can learn everything you need to know there about a reflection non-standard and standard reflection so let's locate the negative one let's locate the value negative one on the x-axis here and so then i'm going to grab see here my red ink here and so negative one is right here on the x-axis so i'm going to just draw a line that goes exactly through that point here so that is my axis now with a reflection remember that the object and the image are equidistance apart so we can't use the pr the principle that we learned in the video that i had done where you know the x changes and the y remains or the y changes and the x remains we can't do that one okay we have to just pretty much count units so now we have to count the distance of each vertex on the trapezium a and match that equal distance from the mirror line to the other side so now you notice that this vertex here okay so this vertex right here is in fact one two three units away from the red line so it's going to be one two three units on the other side of the red line here okay this vertex here is in fact four units away from the red line so that's one two three four so that's one two three four that's right here okay this one is also four units as well so it's going to be four units on this side as well and this one see here is two units so it's going to be one two units as well okay so that's going to be one two units as well All right and then we're going to of course draw this broken line okay it's not drawn so wonderful guys let's see if we can draw it a little bit better it's a little bit better and they say that we should name this rect on um, this trapezium here a prime that's what they have said here so that trying is a that rec that trapezium pardon me is a prime all right so pretty easy so far that's just two marks then uh then now we're looking at translating it okay so translation with vector four minus seven and label it a double prime so it says on the diagram above not drawn to scale a is uh, the, draw the image of A after it undergoes a reflection. So we want the image of A. So we're going to be translating, say here, A. All right. We have to be careful whether we're trans translating A or we're translating A prime. So translating A, the formula then is 
4 uh, the vector is 4 negative 7 now you can actually do this two ways you can actually count the coordinates um, see go 4 to the right and 7 down for each I kind of prefer using my formula then it says one mark so you don't have to use the formula but I'm gonna be just using Okay, so we're going to have O plus T equal I. And then, of course, well, in fact, since I'm going to have to read off the coordinates of the graph and write them down, it then makes sense that I just go on my graph and just take four steps to my right and seven steps down. So I don't need to do the calculation. So from this position here, I'm going to take four steps to my right. So that's going to be, i uh, see here, one two three four and seven steps down one two three four five six seven so this is the position see here all right and then for this one then i'm gonna have one two three four one two three four five six seven Okay, and I could just, I don't have to go through the whole process of saying 4, negative 7 for each. I can just kind of common sense um, out the drawing. Once I have the first two parts here, I can simply then just go ahead and just put a point all the way here. And then I can put, say here, one below here. Okay, so I'm pretty much drawing the same image. So that's what I have. Alright, so you don't need to do it all the way, you just need to, because remember that you're in an exam, so you want to try to save time as best as you can. And that's it. That's all that they had asked for then. Alright, so fantastic. Alright, so it was a nice start, really some interesting, some really interesting applied questions. Um, tricky exam right you have to be very very much prepared you have to know exactly what the formulas are and how to apply so far in this particular upload we didn't find any formulas at the front of the formula sheet that was useful to us as yet but most likely that will happen a bit later down into the video all right so guys look out for the next upload here we're going to be looking at questions four five and six in our next upload so see you then take care bye bye Thank you.